Uh, my name is Grant Wilson. I'm a uh, lecturer here at the university. I lecture in cardiothoracic physiotherapy and also in evidence-based practice where we teach the students about reading medical literature and finding out um, about evidence, what's good evidence for a medical treatment. And I suppose that's one thing that will underlie some of the things that I say tonight. I'll show you some graphs and tables and that from a variety of scientific papers which constitute quite good evidence for the recommendations and for the risks and things that I talk about when I'm talking about snoring and about sleep disordered breathing. So science does underlie uh, the talk tonight and that's why it's being given at a reputable institution like the University of Canberra. Um, so I'm also working in the Faculty of Health Clinics and that's where we run our sleep clinic uh, from. Um, so I, as I shows you on this slide, I work for a number of institutions. These are all the logos of the places where I'm associated with. So here with the university and with our clinic here, our, our uh, clinical service to the community. But we also are uh, private practitioners as well. There's a group of us who run our own private practice out of the university premises. And so uh, we, we have students coming in and learning uh, from us as well. So it's quite a unique sort of setup. I also uh, work for the University of Sydney and also for another uh, company that does uh, sleep studies as well. Um, now our clinic here at the Faculty of Health Clinic, we have a number of services, not just a sleep clinic, but we have physiotherapy and student physiotherapists plus qualified therapists psychology, uh, a very big psychology clinic, again both registered practitioners and um, students, and the Headspace service you may have heard of, they get quite a bit of media attention, they're the youth mental health uh, service. Uh, we have services in nutrition and dietetics and, and then other uh, services as well. And I've put out a few brochures about the different services, many of them that are run by physios, uh, are run by the students are quite reasonably priced. Uh, and you get, you get a quite a lot of time because the students have got time to spend with you to uh, discuss and work through issues with you. So there's those brochures on the table there, they may interest you about the other services run by our clinic. But I'm here to tell you a little bit about sleep, uh, sleeping and sleep breathing. And so the sleep clinic, uh, we undertake a number of activities, but one is the diagnosis of uh, sleep breathing abnormalities and the general investigation of sleep disorders. And that's done uh, usually by going home with a home sleep study. So the patient takes home a kit, they put it all on themselves and they're sort of uh, wired up, up like this uh, overnight. And, um, well, it's not the easiest way to sleep overnight with these sensors on, but uh, most people get a reasonable night's sleep and we're able to make a diagnosis on the basis of, uh, of, these, um, of these kits. Um, but usually the patient takes it home and they actually set themselves up. They bring the device back and then we download it and analyse it and we get uh, data. So these home sleep studies are done on a referral basis. Our patients come from GPs and from specialists who refer to our uh, centre. And to date, since October 2008, we've done um, uh, 1,300 of these uh, home uh, uh, sleep studies here at this uh, clinic. So this shows you the sort of data that we get from a home sleep study. Uh, we measure brain activity so we can tell the person actually is asleep. So when you go to sleep the brain actually slows down and so we see that this brain activity here is significantly slower than when someone's awake. We also measure their heart, rhythm and rate as well. But importantly are the breathing variables. Often we're looking for a breathing issue related to either snoring or the person actually stopping breathing at night. So here's an example of a patient as they actually fall, uh, fall asleep. And uh, here is their breathing here down the bottom. Now we've got five minutes across this page here. So we're seeing quite a lot of breaths in five minutes. For example, if a person's breathing about 15 times per minute, which is a, sort of about average. So here they're breathing in and out, in and out, in and out, quite, quite normally here initially. Then they make the transition into sleep here, and now you can see that this, this breathing trace looks quite different than uh, and before. It starts to get this sort of flattened off 
pop to it. Uh, and then later on we start to see this a new trace here appearing uh, where there's sort of this blackness here. Now that's the person snoring. We're taking the high frequency vibration off their breathing trace. So breathing is normally this smooth sinusoidal trace, but here the person starts to vibrate their airway and that's what snoring is. It's a vibration up here in the palate or around the throat of tissues as the person falls asleep. Now it starts to vibrate because muscles relax uh, in the throat as you fall asleep. Uh, in the same way as, you know, I hope none of you will start to fall asleep uh, during this lecture, but if you do, you'll notice your head start to bob forward in that most embarrassing fashion. And that's because these muscles that are holding your head up start to lose tone. And so the same thing happens on the inside, in the throat, where the, the muscles that are dilating the airway. In fact, the airway is completely floppy and allows us to swallow and vocalise, etc. So in, in sleep, uh, these muscles relax and in about 30 to 40% of the population, they start to vibrate their airway and, and snore. Um, I can tell this person's asleep because of the way I've set up this uh, page here. This black line corresponds to that black line, so they're well and truly asleep while they're snoring away here. Now the important thing about this uh, trace of snoring is it's, it's nice and rhythmical. There's no sort of periods of, of, of uh, under-breathing and over-breathing. It's quite a steady uh, pattern. And we would call this simple snoring, where the person is just snoring and making a uh, noise. It's not actually causing them to wake up. It's not affecting their uh, oxygen level or perhaps uh, not affecting their blood pressure at all as well. Everything is very rhythmical and these bands that are around the thorax and abdomen show that same nice rhythmical um, uh, breathing. So snoring in and of itself, if it's simple snoring and it's not associated with any of these changes I was speaking about, is generally not considered to be a major health hazard for the, for the person. Uh, in the studies that have looked at uh, snoring and breathing abnormalities at night, we can't see an increased rate of stroke, heart attack or death in people who are just straight, uh, straight snores. So that's really the, um, the, the sort of good news about snoring. There may be many other adverse outcomes of snoring, such as the bed partner may not be happy with the uh, situation. Uh, that could be a health hazard depending on what your partner is actually like, yeah. But uh, generally it's not, um, I don't think the rates of homicide are greater in snorers versus um, uh, non-snorers, but I've never actually looked up the data on that specifically, yeah. Um, so there is some interesting data though from Australian researchers that looked at not these big outcomes of, of death or whatever, they just looked at the arteries going up to the brain, the carotid arteries. And they did some ultrasounds on those arteries to see how much they were blocked, how much atherosclerosis or blockage of those arteries was occurring in people who snored for different proportions of the night. And this uh, study was very interesting in that it showed that people who are heavy snorers, snoring more than 50% of the night, had substantially more blockage of their, their arteries going up to their brain than those who are moderate or mild um, snorers. Um, now interestingly, when they did these same ultrasounds on the femoral artery, so down in their legs, they had the same amount of atherosclerosis in the legs, the different snorers, suggesting there was something localised up here to the carotid artery that was making it block off. Interestingly, in three of the snores, they, they did about 50 ultrasounds, in three of the snores they had over 80% blockage of those arteries. And so we would consider them at high risk of having a stroke into the future. Um, so this is uh, what we would call sort of a theoretical or physiological finding, which doesn't particularly translate into the real world samples of, of uh, patients. But for the snorer and for me as a clinician, I find this quite troubling, that when I have a snorer in front of me, uh, what should I recommend? And generally we would recommend trying to abolish the snoring if possible, because theoretically it's associated with these uh, potentially and adverse physiological outcomes. 
And usually clients, when they're faced with this data, usually want to do something about it themselves because they like to uh, not have this sort of thing going on within, within their arteries. Now, why is it happening? Well, it's most probably local trauma due to the vibration of the airway vibrating those arteries, causing them to get inflamed and start to block them. So what do we do about simple snoring? Well, there's a raft of potential uh, treatments. Uh, snoring is commonly associated with, with weight, so uh, being overweight or uh, obese. And so if someone is in this category, we can target our treatment perhaps to losing weight and improving the situation. Interestingly though, um, a substantial proportion of snorers are not overweight. They're of a normal weight or they're of a low weight. And this is usually because of the structure of the face which tends to limit the size of the airway. And I'll show you some photos later of people with limited size of their airway. So losing weight is not always the, the solution. And in fact, in many people, well, that, it just can't work for them because they're not overweight. Positioning on the side versus on the back, when the person's on their side, the tongue is not falling back and they're less likely to have uh, to, be, uh, to be snoring. Reducing anything that may relax the airway. So as you may know, alcohol or sedative medication, uh, it not only uh, relaxes you in terms of you say stupid things when you've got too much alcohol on board, but when you get into bed, then it's also relaxing your throat as well and causing it more likely to, uh, causing it more likely to vibrate. There are a variety of surgical procedures for snoring. Um, one is to remove the, the palate, uh, the, what's called the U triple P, and there's a variety of other sort of laser surgeries. None of these have really been shown um, to be effective, you know, particularly long term for people. We tend to um, recommend not to go the surgical option. Um, try other options first because these surgeries can be associated in some cases with quite troubling side effects such as the regurgitation of food or fluid up into the nose. And uh, every three months or so I will see someone who's had a surgery and they have these side effects and literally they do regret it for the rest of their life. So um, having the surgery, well, it, it's, well, we wouldn't say don't do it absolutely, but try other things first. If someone is snoring and they feel tired, well, we just try and improve their sleep habits, what we call sleep uh, hygiene uh, methods. Uh, there are other things like you could wear a mask, continuous positive airways pressure. So wear a mask like this that puts air inside the airway and splints it open and stops the airway from vibrating. Now many snorers would think that's a totally over the top approach to a problem that they, they have. Um, there are devices that can splint the airway open as well. These are like little band-aid type devices that stick over the nose and they may be potentially useful as well. Most, the most commonly used type of treatment approach where you actually do something other than losing weight is to use a splint, a device that fits into the mouth and brings the jaw forward. Uh, so it protrudes the mandible, the jawbone, and brings it uh, forward. It's called the mandibular advancement splint. And it's quite useful for s simple snores, people who are just snoring, or people with very mild amounts of blockage of airway. Some exercises can be useful as well. So exercises that exercise the palate, like saying vowel sounds, and um, also exercises with the tongue have been shown to be useful as well. So there's a suite of different possibilities for people. Uh, what will work for an individual will depend on their preference. Does the person want to do half an hour of exercise a day on their throat, or would they prefer another option, like a splint or whatever? Now, why snoring is not a joke? Well, we could say it's not a joke because of these potential problems with the arteries blocking. But why it's not a joke is that because substantial number of people who snore are not just having simple snoring. They're in flat fact blocking their airway at night. They have a condition called obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, across all snorers, about 25% would have this condition. 
as the snoring becomes more regular and persistent or more disturbing to the partner, generally the chances of sleep apnea being present are much, uh, much greater. If snoring is a long-standing thing, the chance of having obstructive sleep apnea is increased. Now, the shortening for, o for obstructive sleep apnea is OSA, and you'll see that on the other slides. So here we've got the same sort of trace as I showed you before from a sleep study. In fact, it's the same uh, fellow just later in the night, and now he's starting to block the airway. Now we don't have the rhythmical breathing. You can notice that you have periods where the person is not breathing as much, and then periods where they're breathing very deeply. And these periods of not breathing are associated with the oxygen level dropping down, because not enough oxygen is getting into the lungs during these periods where the airway is not only vibrating, but actually blocking over to some degree, a partial blockage. Now the thing that keeps the person breathing, because you're effectively choking yourself, is the fact that these receptors within the airway, within the throat, sense the pressure, sense the choke, and cause the person to have a little wakening from their sleep. So here I've drawn this black line again. It's at the end of this event where the person's blocked their airway. So that's up here on our brain activity. Our brain activity is 30 seconds across. It's in a much higher magnitude. Now, prior to this black line up here, the person's asleep. While they're choking themselves, they're asleep. Then they have the return of a fast black activity because they wake up and they start breathing again here. You can see, even in this 30 seconds, the guy's been awake in the early part of the 30 seconds. And that's because he's been recovering from the previous event. So sleep apnea has, is, is associated with these periods of partial or complete blockage of the uh, airway. And it's associated with little wakings from sleep that the person is not aware of generally uh, them, themselves. The bed partner may see these events, um, but the, the bed partner may think they're sleeping perfectly fine. Interestingly, in this case, if we look at the snoring, you can see that the snoring decreases at times and increases. And in fact, his snoring is decreasing when he's blocking the airway, because there's not enough air going down into the lung to actually make the airway actually shake, as would be happening in um, someone who was uh, snoring. So here's another example of it in another patient. We've got five minutes of recording here. In this patient, they're completely blocking their airway for a period of over a minute here. This fellow is blocking it. Now, it was particularly bad in this patient because he had a heart disease, heart failure. Now, you can see what happens. This is the thing around his abdomen here as he's trying to breathe. We're measuring his abdomen moving. You see how it gets larger and larger and larger, the, the efforts to breathe. The same thing as if I grabbed you around the throat You'd start to try and breathe, and then as it went longer, you'd try harder and harder and harder to breathe. And that's what happens during, during uh, an apneic event. Now, what that does is you're trying to suck air inside your lung, and uh, you create a big vacuum, and the negative pressure gets created inside your chest. Now, your heart is inside there trying to pump away. If you create a vacuum around the heart, it will just get sucked out, increase in size. Now, if you increase the size of the heart, the heart doesn't know what's going on. It thinks too much blood is inside. And so it releases this uh, peptide into the blood that causes you to get rid of fluid out of your body. And so many people with sleep apnea will wake during the night to the toilet uh, because their body is trying to get rid of fluid out of their body. And when you measure their blood in the morning, their blood is much thicker than it was when they went to bed the previous uh, night. And that creates problems because you've got to get up to the toilet in many cases. Uh, and the other thing is that the blood is more likely to clot when it's uh, thicker. If we measure some variables, so if we measure the blood pressure, for example, so here we've got a blood pressure cuff that's measuring every single beat. We've got it on the finger. And you see that the blood pressure surges up at the end of these events. Uh, and it's all related to the stress. There's a release of stress hormones into the body, similar to if you were being choked. Also, the oxygen level falls down at the same time. So there's a number of uh, meeting of a whole heap of physiological abnormalities which uh, are particularly adverse to the blood vessels and to the heart. And this is why sleep apnea can cause a stress on the body over, over time. 
Now, what we do know from studies that have uh, looked at sleep apnea, um, that if we take different levels of sleep apnea, and we quantify sleep apnea by measuring the number of these blockages per hour of sleep. So we quantify them on a sleep study. So in this study from Canada, where they looked at their public servants, uh, uh, th over a thousand of their public servants, were, had a full health check, and they also had a sleep study. They found that some people had sleep apnea, and here you can see the degrees of sleep apnea. Some had absolutely none. Some had under five blockages per hour, five to 15, and over 15 blockages per hour, what we consider moderate sleep apnea. Um, and then they came back four years later after this health check and worked out and said, well, and did the measurements of blood pressure again, and lo and behold, a whole group of them had become hypertensive. They'd, their blood pressure had uh, elevated over the four years. Now, the elevation in blood pressure was linked to the amount of sleep apnea they had on ba at baseline. It was also linked to the other factors, their lack of physical activity, smoking, um, their level of weight. Was, these are things we all know are associated with high blood pressure. But irrespective of those factors, they were taken into consideration. Sleep apnea led to increased risk of developing high blood pressure. So in those with 15 blockages per hour, they were approximately three times more likely to develop high blood pressure. Those with five to 15 blockages were twice as likely to develop high blood pressure. And those with any amount of sleep apnea had about a 40% increased <coughs> risk. So any level of sleep apnea does increase the risk of high blood pressure developing uh, over time. And we know it is related causally to the presence of having sleep apnea at, uh, at night. And this is evidence that those physiological changes that I showed you on the sleep study translate into real health problems for people uh, over time. Now if we look at the really large health outcomes, so the ones you would like to avoid, such as heart attack and stroke and, and death, uh, that's really one you'd really like to avoid. Uh, if we look at those outcomes versus the amount of sleep apnea measured on a sleep study in a sleep clinic, we can see graphs that, like this that have been used just by observing patients over time, uh, doing a sleep study and then coming back over many years and interviewing people and interviewing their families about what happened to them. And here you can see the rates of, in this graph here, uh, those that had uh, a non-fatal cardiovascular event, which was basically heart attacks and strokes and, and onsets of heart failure, failure of the heart to pump. Um, and so in the group that had severe sleep apnea, 30 blockages of their airway per hour, you can see that 30% had these events uh, that were non-fatal, caused them not to die. 15% of them, or over 15, near 20%, had uh, a fatal stroke or heart attack or event. Um, so over the 12 years of the study, 144 months, over 50% of those with the severe sleep apnea had had one of these events. The control subjects had no problems at all. They didn't have snoring or anything. And they're the green line here. And you can see their rates of strokes and heart attacks. So sleep apnea is not the only cause of these problems. These problems are happening in people without any breathing problem at all. But at a much lower rate, about 5% or less than 5% in each group. Um, when, we looked at the, when they looked at the snorers and people with only mild problems, you can see that the graphs sort of lie relative to each other. So snorers appear to have more risk than people without any breathing problem, uh, although not significant enough to be considered a real difference. Uh, but those with mild sleep apnea um, have more risk than the snorers. So this underlies, again, our uh, advice to people that we would like the snoring uh, got rid of. Uh, interesting, there's a group who started on uh, the CPAP device, uh, on one of these machines to treat sleep apnea that opens the airway, and you can see the reduction in their rate of these major events. They're the blue line here on both those graphs. So this uh, evidence underlies our recommendation in many cases to try this device and to use it uh, long term for uh, treatment of their uh, disorder. We believe that they we would hope that they would live longer and better with less health problems when they uh, are started on this device.
Now those who have used strict scientific evidence, uh, which we should do, would say that there are problems with this sort of gathering of information from people. People who use a device at night to sleep are likely to adhere more to their doctor's advice, take their medications and do, you know, if their doctor says go for a walk, they're more likely to. Uh, whereas people who don't adhere to the machine are more likely perhaps not to take their doctor's advice and so have more, other, more associated risks across a period of time. So we do need to take that into consideration. So in summary then, sleep apnea can be associated with a number of uh, adverse health outcomes related to the development of high blood pressure, heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, which means disease of the vessels and potentially a stroke that it would occur, uh, abnormal rhythms of the heart, which might be related to low oxygen or stretching of the heart. Uh, we're unsure whether sleep apnea is actually causally linked to diabetes. In fact, it's most probably not. Uh, although we do know that we can improve the insulin resistance of diabetics in many cases if we treat the sleep apnea. And this may be particularly relevant to people who are not overweight and are diabetic, uh, where they seem to get the best uh, results from sleep apnea treatment. So a lot of these studies come from Asia where the diabetics are not particularly overweight. Now to many people with sleep apnea, or they may be concerned about all these factors, but it may be a little bit highfalutin for them, they may uh, be considering more the way they actually feel day to day. You know, I don't feel, uh, don't feel good. And so sleep apnea has a number of consequences in terms of the way that people, uh, that people feel during the day. Now the tricky thing is that sleep loss affects people in all different ways and no one client has the same story about what, how this condition may be affecting them. Uh, indeed, uh, some patients complain of sleepiness, being sleepy during the day, but we know that over half the people with sleep apnea are not sleepy at all. So when we go out into the community, we find all these people who've got the condition, but it doesn't make them sleepy. In the same way as many people can deprive themselves of sleep and hardly feel tired at all. So it affects people in different ways. But commonly the reason for someone coming to the sleep clinic will be tiredness. I feel tired, I lack energy, I lack motivation. People describe it in different ways. One uh, common feature is unrefreshing sleep. So the person complains that I seem to sleep seven or eight hours, but I don't feel like I'm getting a good night's uh, sleep. Other things relate to just poor sleep. You know, if you deprive yourself of sleep, you know that the next day you can't concentrate as well. Your memory might be off. You may have difficulties retaining information. Um, Sometimes the patients complain of choking, but that's very, very rare that somebody will say, look, I feel like I'm actually choking. Usually the, the client is not aware of it. Uh, gasping may be noticed by the bed partner um, who knows at the end of the events. Uh, nocturia is uh, the fancy name for uh, going, getting up to the toilet at night, um, so once or twice. Uh, mood problems, irritability might start to surface and, in, and depression is very closely linked to sleep apnea. In fact, if we go into the psychology clinic where people are being treated for depression, uh, we will find that 40% of the people have sleep apnea to, uh, to a degree of about 15 blockages of their airway per hour. So the two things go together quite closely. Uh, there's reduced uh, rectile dysfunction and decreased uh, libido often with sleep apnea. Weight gain, so the person is trying to lose weight but they, they uh, can't. And it may be related to their inability to exercise and be active uh, or related to the dysfunction in their sleep. Dry throat, dry mouth is common due to the gasping for breath and morning he headache is seen as well. So in different people we have these different features. One person just may complain of the headache and not, nothing else. Others may have a whole series of these different problems that they're complaining about. Interestingly, some people might complain of going to the toilet or not. They thought it was related to a prostate enlargement or that they just had a weak bladder when in fact it's related to this, uh, this cause. Now when we investigate someone in the sleep clinic, it's very important that we consider 
all the different causes of someone being sleepy. And so this is just for your interest to show you what we do when we evaluate a patient clinically. Uh, at some clinics there seems to be a fascination with just sleep apnea as the cause of sleepiness, but we know there are many, many different causes of sleepiness. And as clinicians, we've got these all in the back of our mind when we're evaluating a patient uh, for a sleep breathing problem, because they may have any of these other causes of, of sleepiness. One of them is just not getting enough sleep. In fact, that's the most common cause for daytime sleepiness in the general population. So it's not just sleep apnea when someone says they're sleepy. The bed partner often has something to say about this as well in the consultations and I've had quite a lot of marital discord in my um, consulting room across the year about, uh, across the years about whether the person snores or what is actually going on. Uh, and some of that can be related to the irritability that the person has related to many, many years of poor sleep unbeknownst to them. So the bed partner will often complain about the snoring, they may see the person stopping breathing and they may notice that the person is very restless. As they're recovering from the breathing events, their legs kick and they may roll and things. And they have a tendency to a more irritable mood uh, during the day or to a depressed mood. Now it's uh, also, it's, so it's important for the person themselves, uh, it's important for the bed partner, but it's also important for the public at large, this condition as well. Because sleep apnea does affect uh, public safety. Because people who've got the condition, uh, they can be sleepy, but they lack attention to tasks that they're doing. And one of those tasks is driving. So here these data is gathered from driving simulator studies where a control group is measured. This is their steering error as they're driving along a road and they have to, and they have to um, avoid uh, cows and things that sort of start to wander across the road, etc. So these are the control group without any uh, problems at all. You can see the number of their uh, steering errors. Some people are just bad drivers, uh, but the majority are down here with very low steering errors. If somebody drinks alcohol, and this is twice the legal limit for alcohol in Australia, you can see that there's a diverse range of effects on driving. Some people actually can seem to drive reasonably well under the influence of uh, alcohol. Um, if we look at those with sleep apnea, these are people with 15 blockages of their airway per hour. They drive similar to those who are, are drunk. Um, so it's, it's got implications for the, the safety of the general public. That people with sleep apnea don't, they can't attend as well, and so when something happens, they're more likely to have a motor vehicle accident. In fact, we know that people with sleep apnea have got about the same risk as somebody who's driving drunk. Uh, people with 30 blockages per hour with severe sleep apnea are about 15 times more likely to have a car accident. So the, but you don't see uh, ads on the telly every night about sleep apnea, you, you see it about alcohol, etc. This is the, so the distribution of the number of blockages of the airway across the population. So you may be wondering, well how common is this, this actual condition? And it is quite uh, common in the population. Um, so here you can see uh, 0 to 5 blockages of the airway per hour and the vast majority of the population are fitting within that, that zone and that's generally considered normal. But then there's a spread of the population, so this is the percentage of the population having these number of blockages. So a substantial proportion, almost 2% of the population are blocking their airway almost uh, once a minute over 60 times an hour. So you can see that sort of spread there. If you look at uh, men uh, across the lifespan, and so as you get older, does it get worse? And the answer is yes, it does get worse. And it's most probably the effects of uh, fat deposition within the airway, because as you get older, you become less physically active and generally more uh, overweight. Uh, and so for 45 year old men, about 10% of them are blocking their airway 15 times per hour. Now relate that to what I just said about the driving. It's quite scary. Uh, now the, as you um, 
get older, so by the age of 55, you know, it's about 12.5%, 65, it's about 15, 17% of people have got uh, 15 blockages of their airway per hour. So it is quite uh, common. But many, many of these people aren't going to be complaining of sleepiness. So what are the risk factors for actually having uh, this condition? Uh, often they're physical features of the client. So as I've said, it is associated with overweight and obesity because it puts more fat into the, the airway, surrounding the airway, and limits the size of the airway. Uh, also, the length of the airway is also very important. Men tend to have a longer airway than females, and that makes them more likely to block their airway. After menopause, women's airways stretch, stretch out and they catch up to men. So after menopause, they have the same rate of um, uh, sleep apnea as, uh, as men. Uh, the neck circumference is important. So a neck circumference of 40 centimetres in a female or 43 centimetres in a male is highly predictive for the presence of sleep apnea. Now, as I said also, the facial shape's very important here and the position and size of the jaw. So if the jaw is set back, what we call retrognathia, uh, it limits the size of the airway running here behind. So without any extra weight, the person has a small airway and it's more likely to, uh, to block it. So a family history is often associated here due to either due to facial shape or due to the level of obesity due to environmental or, or inherited characteristics. So not all sleep apnea patients look like this fellow who you might sort of think, oh, that's what people look like with sleep apnea. It's not the case. This, this patient actually has got some very interesting mottling of his skin here, and that is associated not with sleep apnea, well, it is associated with sleep apnea, because he was smoking in bed and he kept falling asleep and dropping the cigarette on his, um, on his chest all the time and, uh, and burning himself regularly. So what do we do about it? What do we do about sleep apnea? And this list is very similar to the list for snoring because the, the physiology is fundamentally the same. There's sort of like a spectrum where the person goes from just vibrating the airway to the situation in which the airway is blocking down regularly overnight. Now what the treatment would be would depend on a whole heap of different factors. Uh, the number of blockages of the airway per hour, what the person is complaining about as to, have they got symptoms, have they got problems with their cardiovascular system, high blood pressure or heart problems, or family history, risk of strokes and heart attacks and things. Um, so, uh, but you can see the, the list is uh, comprehensive, but perhaps not one treatment would work in any one, and we get them to do multiple different uh, things. So lifestyle change is important, reducing weight. So weight loss, and I'll show you a, a picture about how weight loss affects sleep apnea. Increasing physical activity to uh, reduce weight and also to augment the upper airway just by breathing harder. Uh, reducing alcohol, smoking and sedation, and also having good sleep habits. When a person doesn't sleep enough, they're more likely to have more sleep apnea. In some people, just positioning on their side can be helpful. And this can be done with pillows or there's new devices now that vibrate when you actually go over onto your back and basically tell you to get over onto your side. Uh, it's basically like a bed partner. You know, the bed partner pokes you or this thing vibrates on your chest and it's got a sensor that can sense when you're going over onto your back. That may be helpful in someone who's only got sleep apnea on their back. Doing exercises can be helpful in more mild levels of sleep apnea. And these appliances that I mentioned for sleep apnea, these devices that bring the jaw forward, are good in the mild, can be good in the milder levels of sleep apnea. As I suggested, surgery on the airway, we don't generally recommend, but uh, sometimes surgery for weight loss can be very useful as well. One treatment that I'll talk to you a little bit more about is this is the positive pressure device, the CPAP device, which stands for Continuous Positive Airways Pressure or Automatic Positive Airways Pressure. This is a device which can hold the airway open. It's a treatment, it's not a cure for the problem. 
What can be a cure for the problem, fundamentally, is losing weight, if it's associated with being overweight. Here we can see a large group of men who over a period of a year, over 52 weeks, all lost weight. They all lost weight as part of a program. And uh, here you can see each individual client here is represented by a line. And so you can see every individual losing weight. They all move to the left here. This is their weight in kil kilograms here. So some people lose substantial weight. This fellow here went from 130 down to sort of 115. This is the improvement in his sleep apnea index. Now to get into this study, you have to have moderate sleep apnea above 15 blockages per hour. So he loses all this weight and his sleep apnea index is under five. He's effectively in the normal range. All these patients were using a breathing device at night and about 25% of them came off the device at the end of the year. They cured themselves of the problem by getting their index under five. Now, interestingly, as you can see, the graphs are all sort of moving down this way, generally. As you lose weight, it does get better. But when you look at individuals, some of them don't do the same as the group. And here you can see these ones that are flat lining here. They lose the weight, but they don't get any better. And they're people who it's associated with perhaps jaw position and the position of the face and what their face is doing. Uh, so losing weight is a recommendation to people with sleep apnea, but whether it will be curative, um, uh, we're unsure. We can't promise any person. Now, they all use the CPAP machine to maintain them at the position of safe breathing overnight uh, because the, the CPAP machine will get rid of the breathing problem. Also, it's associated often with more energy and motivation and less sleepiness, and it allows the person then to lose weight more easily. So this is what the device actually does. Under the normal conditions, we're sucking air into our airway. That's what these little lines mean. Negative pressure, we're creating a vacuum and sucking the air from outside to into our lungs. In sleep apnea, we have this blockage here in the upper airway where it, it flops shut. Uh, CPAP treatment, which was an Australian invention, invented at Sydney Uni by Professor Colin Sullivan, uh, invented actually by total accident. <laughs> they were trying to do an experiment on the upper airway and they put pressure in there to try and hold the airway open so they could get their sensors in there. And lo and behold, they realised that they could open the airway up and stop the problem from occurring. And uh, so they put a positive pressure, an air pressure. It's basically a fancy reverse cycle air, can, uh, a reverse cycle vacuum cleaner. That's what the thing is, yeah. It puts pressure in and it holds the airway open. It splints the airway open. Now, every individual would would require a different pressure to keep their airway open, depending on the propensity for it to block, to block off. And this shows you, this is from Professor Sullivan's uh, initial studies, where he was looking at this device. Here we've got the pressure within the circuit, so it's, there's no pressure initially. This is the person's breathing here, so they're stopping, starting, stopping, starting, stopping, starting. We increase the pressure in the circuit and they're breathing completely normalises and their oxygen level which is up here doesn't go up and down now it stays uh, stays elevated and normal. We turn the machine off so we release the pressure and the person immediately starts to block their airway stop and start stop and start again and their oxygen level drops down. Now initially these apparatuses for sleep apnea were uh, that they were quite involved. Here you can see the patient with this mask and these tubes, these massive tubes, because we didn't have very good motors back in those early days. The mask was made out of like a celastic. The person mixed it up at night and then plastered the mask to their face. Yeah. Then someone came up with a brilliant idea of using straps. I don't know who that uh, was. So maybe you could strap the mask onto the face. And so then subsequently masks were strapped onto the patient's face but they were still quite large. Uh, here you can see reconstructions of the, of the airway here. So here's where the person's not receiving any pressure and the airway is very, very narrow. As we increase the pressure and the pressure's measured in centimetres of water, the airway increases in volume and opens up. And here we can see someone without any pressure, a very small airway, 
versus an airway that's receiving pressure and the airway is opening up. So that's what's happening on the inside as we apply this treatment. Uh, so there's different types of machines. There's ones that will go at one level. So this is all night long. It's just going at one level. And there's now newer devices that will go up and down. There really is no absolute benefit of one versus another. In the real world, in our clinic, about 80% of people decide to go with a single level of pressure. And that's because they're the only ones the government will supply for free to pensioners. Uh, or it's substantially cheaper to buy a single level pressure and so people feel quite comfortable on it, they go with that one. Versus some clients would like an automatic one, one that goes up and down across the night depending on their need. So studies have tried to look at uh, sleep apnea and uh, quantify its effects. It's been quite hard to do these studies. And that's because people with sleep apnea present in so many different ways. Some are sleepy, some are not. Some go to the toilet and some don't. Uh, some choke and others don't. So it's made the actual quantification of the effects of, um, of uh, CPAP treatment and treatment for sleep apnea quite difficult. It's a very slippery fish trying to measure this, um, uh, this disorder. But studies have emphatically shown that patients do feel less sleepy when they use CPAP machines and that's objectively measured when we do tests of their sleepiness. This is just to show you, this is from a, a, a type of study called a Cochrane Review where we gather information from very high quality scientific projects and we gather lots of different data from different studies gather it all up together and find out what the findings were. And the findings are in favour of, of a CPAP device makes people feel uh, less sleepy and that's what this data actually shows. And it's a very robust sort of science science. So there are many different effects and improvements that any different person can report. Uh, improvements in their subjective or objective sleepiness, improvement in their thinking, their neurocognitive function, their quality of life improves, a QOL. Reductions in blood pressure can ensue and reductions in abnormal rhythms of the heart. It's been shown that people's heart function improves, their heart actually pumps better. And it, as I said before, insulin sensitivity can improve with this sort of therapy as well. So although sleep apnea is a serious medical condition, there are therapies that can largely address um, the, the consequences of it and uh, perhaps alter people's ultimate outcome.